Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and welcome back to our discussion of understanding contemporary art. Right now, we're in the middle of a discussion of the works of the great British land artist, uh, Andy Goldsworthy. Uh, and so we are looking at, we finished off last, last time with his works in the mid 80s. So I want to continue to resume right from where we left off. Um, one of the things about Goldsworthy that I want you to keep in mind is the sense in which uh, his work almost has the feel of, of forms that are being unleashed from the earth, as though the earth itself were making these forms, and he were simply somehow peering into its hidden morphogenetic processes, and he were cracking open stones and wood and cliffs and rocks and unleashing the morphogenetic, that is to say the form-building potential that is already inherently present. Nature knows what it's doing. This Goldsworthy, in a certain sense, is coming out of this um, Celtic, ancient Celtic tradition that has affinities with um, some of the ancient Germanic ideas about the earth having its own instinctive wisdom. You find this a lot in India as well, having its own instinctive form building wisdom, its own wisdom body. Uh, this is most recently updated, of course, in the Gaia hypothesis uh, of James Lovelock and uh, Lynn Margulis. But this is the idea that the earth knows what it is doing and it's simply building and shaping its own forms. And in a certain respect, Goldsworthy has a real talent, I think, for uh, unleashing those form building potentials in nature, in the earth. Um, if we look at this work here, this is uh, Sand Edge to Catch the Early Light from 1983 from Abersock, North Wales in 1983. And this is the first of his serpentine forms uh, that he constructed out of sand. Note that it's built on the beach. Uh, out of sand, like a sand castle. It's something that uh, the tides are going to wash away uh, in a matter of hours, so it's an incredibly ephemeral work. And he likes the serpentine form, although he insists that the, the serpentine form in his works is really the river. And for him, the river isn't the flow of water, it's flows, periods. A river for him can be a flow of anything, a flow of birds, a flow of stones, a flow of humans, a flow of energy. So he's always capturing the dynamism and the flows um, the sort of lines of flight that are constantly moving across uh, the surface of the earth in various forms. And now here's another one of his uh, very ephemeral works. This is Touching North from 1989 in which we see him building sort of these ice, uh, ice rings that will melt soon. Uh, and so it's uh, really all we've got of the image is just, or of the work itself is, is the image of its once having existed. Uh, these are very ephemeral works. This one here is um, Seven Holes from 1991, which was done for the Greenpeace UK offices. And uh, they started to crack as he was making it. It started to, um, this, this series of cracks started to be evident, and he set himself to repair the cracks and then realized that the cracks were the most interesting thing about the work. So he left them there, and this has implications for his later works, um, as we'll see. This is Dandelions uh, from 1993. Um, Goldsworthy does not paint. He never uses paint. If he wants a pigment, he takes two stones from a river and from a river and rubs them together, uh, and he might get some red from the iron oxide content that's in the stones or in the, the river that gives it its red quality, or he'll use, uh, instead of paint, he'll use flowers and leaves. Here we have dandelions as though they look like a, a puddle of yellow paint that someone dripped or dropped, or as though it were simply uh, a natural thing like uh, magma coming out of left behind in a pool by a volcano or something. Uh, his works have the uncanny ability to insert themselves in nature in a way that looks as though they, they somehow belong there. Um, this is a work of his called Clay Wall that he did uh, for the Haynes Gallery in San Francisco in 1996. Um, it reminds us of uh, some Arte Povera works such as the Cracked Earth works by Alberto Bori uh, but he says, Goldsworthy says, he was inspired by the dry, arid climate of the Southwest to create this work of cracked earth on this clay wall. Here at the Getty Research Center in the following year, in 1997, he did uh, another version of those seven rings that he had done for the Greenpeace offices in the UK. Uh, this was done in Los Angeles for the Getty Research Institute. It looks like a much more successful version of that earlier work. And he aligned it on the floor uh, in such a way as specifically to catch the sunlight once a year uh, on the midsummer solstice, so during the summer solstice point, the sun shines directly on it, um, also causing it to dry out, causing cracks to appear, and then eventually, uh, at some point, a, a, a burst water pipe in the museum washed it away, uh, as though uh, to replicate uh, the fate of his works, that uh, the normal fate of his works when they're built out in nature. 
His works sit rather uncomfortably, I think, inside museums and installations. They don't really belong there. There's an alien aspect to them. They belong in nature, natural settings. Uh, this one here is Leaf River Stone from 1999, and this combines his uh, serpentine river form with uh, the ability to paint using uh, leaves and flowers and arranging them in such a way as to suggest that the, the colors are these natural striations that uh, the earth just produced on its own. This one here is one of my favorites. This is uh, two trunks uh, extended into sand. Uh, this was done in Holland in 1999. And here the tree trunks are extended in such a way to look like a pair of large intertwining serpents. Uh, but it very much, and in India, uh, Nagas, serpents, are connected with trees. They're connected with roots. And it creates a kind of rhizome with the tangled up roots and the power of the earth and the serpents. Um, he came back a couple of days later and found that people had just walked all over these things and uh, they're mere sand constructions after all. Once again, illustrating the incredible ephemerality of these works. He does have more permanent works though with these stone cairns. This is one of them, one of his famous stone cairns from 2001 that are much closer to the sense of the kind of land art that James Terrell does, uh, which has, once an artist is dealing with stone, he is dealing, stone is traditionally a symbol for the eternal, whereas the tree, or uh, it tends to be the symbol for the temporal. Uh, Joyce plays with this in Finnegan's Wake with Tristan, his name Tristan is tree stone, indicating the ephemeral and the eternal, interlocked and interwoven together. Here we have a stone construction that will last obviously much longer, than uh, many of his much more ephemeral works having been built in stone. And the stone corbeling itself suggests, of course, these ancient stone structures uh, from this, these are the sort of beehive houses from the I island of Skellig Michael from the eighth century AD, um, built by Irish Christian monks. Um, it, it's evocative of that. But here in this one, we have a, a much more ephemeral version of that. This is an ice cairn, an ice version. Uh, built uh, to last not very long. The snow, there are photographs of it showing that the, the air melting it very quickly. Um, and here, even the fate of one of his stone cairns, uh, we see a sequence of images showing us the stone cairns slowly being engulfed and washed up by the sea. Uh, they remind me of like stone pine cones. Um, and here the sea is reclaiming it. Goldsworthy likes the touch uh, he, he does not ever use gloves when he works. So he likes the sense of the haptic, tactile feel. There's a kind of magic that is based, is based on the interaction of his hands with these natural formations. Um, and he says that even though, uh, especially in the documentary movie Rivers and Tides that was made about him, which is excellent, um, he's, he remains in contact, he says, uh, since his hands built this work with this stone cairn, even while it is underwater and washed up. Here's another one of his works, uh, Yellow and Gold Leaves. Um, he has a habit of stitching leaves together uh, into chains, polymerized leaves, uh, and he doesn't glue them. He sews them together with little stalks or thorns. Um, and here we have maple uh, leaves, yellow and gold leaves. I, I believe they're maple leaves around a single hole. And it looks like something that might naturally have occurred there, like a bird's nest. Um, a vortex of some kind that, that, that simply morphogenetically formed itself into being. And I think that part of Goldsworthy's ontology is that of autopoiesis. These are, uh, he conveys the illusion in his works of uh, an autopoietic nature, nature's self-making ability to create its own forms, rather than the myth with James Terrell, let's say, would be the myth of the maker, the demiurge, the master craftsman who is uh, separate from nature, and creates structures and simply sets them down into nature as eternal forms. Whereas Goldsworthy suggests the myth of the autopoietic aspect of nature creating its own forms with its own powers, not the myth of the demiurge. And here this is a more recent work from 2004 called Roof, um, which is sort of half in and half out of the museum. But I think it illustrates very interestingly the sense to the degree to which Goldsworthy's works do not feel comfortable inside of museums and installations. They look alien there. They, they look like they don't want to be there. And they look much better, I think, out in natural context, as we have seen. And this work uh, is a more recent, recent one, 2007, Hanging Trees, uh, where it looks like he's building enclosures to begin swallowing up natural forms. His work looks better out in nature, but now it's beginning to engulf natural forms. So it'll be interesting to see what direction his art goes uh, as he continues with this path of swallowing up forms. 
So that, I think, is a good stopping point that gives us a sense of Andy Goldsworthy as a great land artist uh, in opposition to James Terrell as a, a great American land artist. And that gives us a sense of land art as tracing lines of flight and using the earth as a surface of inscription uh, for these beautiful forms, many of them very transitory. Uh, a great deal of land art is, in essence, transitory, not just Andy, Andy Goldsworthy's works, but a lot of the works of land art um, have been weathered by time and washed away. Uh, people have had trouble finding Robert Smithson's spiral jetty, uh, which as the Salt Lake rises and falls, uh, tends to disappear. It's still there and it's in a phase now where it's visible. Uh, but these works tend to, they're not going to last. They're very ephemeral works by nature. So uh, we'll stop there uh, for Andy Goldsworthy.